Nevada has a new U.S. attorney, and we're talking to him in an exclusive interview right here on Nevada Politics Today. I'm your host, Victor Jakes. Nicholas Tertanich became Nevada's U.S. attorney in January. He previously served as chief of staff to then Attorney General Adam Laxalt. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Victor. Well, let's start with the news about Kelvin Atkinson. Uh, he resigned from the state senate a few weeks ago after admitting to stealing almost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and that came after your office launched an investigation let's go to clip one and listen to what irs agent tara sullivan said at a news conference your office held after he announced his his guilty plea first let me thank the u.s attorney for his tremendous leadership not on just this case but on all public corruption cases that he is overseeing in the district what other public corruption cases uh, is she referring to? Sure, I appreciate the question, Victor. Mm -hmm. uh, as I sit here today, I'm not going to be able to confirm mm -hmm. or deny the existence of any investigation. Mm -hmm. But what I can say about public corruption is that uh, the people of Nevada should be proud of their elected officials. Mm -hmm. The vast, vast majority of them are doing right by their constituents. They're serving their people um, with integrity and honesty mm -hmm. and civility. I want to talk about a marijuana in 2018, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions gave the, the U.S. District Attorney's prosecutorial discretion over whether or not to enforce federal marijuana law. That, that's you. Are, are sure. you going to enforce federal marijuana law? Sure. Uh, I've been pretty clear about this. Uh, drug, uh, drug use and crime rates go hand in hand, and uh, mm -hmm. Nevada's not safer because marijuana is available on every single street corner. Uh, what I will say about federal enforcement of marijuana laws is we do so with uh, consistent with the priorities of the offices and the resources of the office. And we talk about drug use. In, in, in Nevada, there's drugs that are killing people, opioids, fentanyl. Our office has been a shining star in prosecuting those type of cases, medical professionals that, uh, that flood the streets, feed into addiction of people, and there's overdoses as a result. So you talk about the priorities of your office. I mean, you're setting those priorities. Is, is prosecuting marijuana a priority? Sure. We have, we have prosecution of federal laws. That's, what I'm not going to do is sit here and say, we're going after this, we're going after that. But we evaluate cases that are brought to us based on the sufficiency of the evidence uh, and, and the resources that we have in the office. Right now, opioids and, and fentanyl and heroin are, are a scourge throughout Nevada. Uh, we've been a shining star in, in going after that priority area. You know, I, I understand if you're having to, like, uncover crime, but, I mean, marijuana stores have billboards <laughs> advertising that they're selling marijuana. They're, you know, flaunting federal law. How many resources does it take to go into a place where you know where they are, you know they're violating federal law, and, and charge them? Sure, but when we're, when we're looking at cases to prosecute. We also have to look at the sufficiency of the evidence. We have to look at... Uh, there's, there's lots of evidence. I mean, I think you'd agree with that. You, you well, could charge someone with selling marijuana. I mean, they have businesses. They have signs. Sure. And then we also look at priority areas for the department and as well as, as, well as whether or not uh, uh, the office uh, resources can, can uh, bring to bear a, mer a meritorious prosecution. And so when we're looking at that, we look at Project Safe Neighborhoods, which is going after violent crime. That is, uh, it poses, violent crime poses a clear threat to our, our neighborhoods. Opioids, clear threat to our neighborhoods. People so, are dying. So marijuana is not a priority? No, that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that I enforce federal law consistent with priorities and resources of the office. So you won't tell me what those priorities are? Sure I will. I'm going to list through. Is uh, there, I mean, are you, I mean, people are investing literally millions of dollars into these marijuana businesses that are legal under Nevada law, illegal under, under federal law. Are you going to prosecute them? We look at every single case with the facts that are presented uh, and the sufficiency of the evidence and balance it against the priorities of the office as well as our resources. If you're talking about uh, whether we're going to go after you know, this or that, I'm not going to talk about specific cases, but I can tell you, I can outline my priorities for you. All right. Well, one case you are going after involves Clive and Bundy. Uh, in 2014, he's the, the cattle rancher that the feds <coughs> went after him, tried to take his cows. There was a standoff. It didn't end well. Uh, the feds did a fake documentary film to, to try and, and get evidence against, against him. Uh, the case was ultimately dismissed last year when the judge basically found that the prosecutors uh, withheld evidence improperly. You, you filed an appeal in that case. Why? Sure. 
So when I think about uh, the Bundy case and the Bundy prosecution, the first thing that comes to my mind uh, are the law enforcement officers that kissed their families goodbye uh, that day in 2014, went to work, and were standing at the, at the other end of a high-powered uh, firearm, uh, or several of them. And so those are victims. And they're real victims of, of, of a real crime. And so uh, what we've done at the Ninth Circuit is ask for review of the remedy uh, that the judge imposed. She dismissed the case with prejudice. And we respectfully disagree with that remedy. But if you win, I mean, you'll be able to charge them again. Yeah, right now it's at the Ninth Circuit. We filed a lengthy brief. It's 75, 80 pages. You've probably read it. Uh, to distill it uh, right here is going to be hard to do, but essentially the top level is the remedy is wrong. And once the, uh, once the Ninth Circuit issues a decision uh, in that, many months from now, we'll evaluate next steps. So even if you win, you may not charge Clive and Bundy again? What I'll say is the ball is in the Ninth Circuit's court. Uh, when the Ninth Circuit pushes it back to my side of the court, we'll make a decision. You know, I think the disconnect is you, you've just talked about, you know, we don't, we don't have, marijuana is not a priority. Marijuana increases crime, but we don't have the resources to go after everyone. And then here's this cattle rancher in, you know, Bunkersville, Nevada, that no one's ever heard of, that just wants to be left alone. Why does your office have the resources to go after him, but not to go after these, these marijuana businesses that are advertising that they're flouting federal law? Well, as you know, federal prosecution takes uh, a long time. That, that the Bundy-Bunkerville standoff happened in uh, 2014. We're still talking about it in 2019. So when we uh, choose cases to bring, we need to be judicious. We need to make sure that we're doing justice. Um, I came in uh, to this office in early January, long after the Bundy case was tried, but I was proud uh, to stand w shoulder to shoulder with members of the FBI, the BLM, that had uh, firearms pointed at them because of their position in federal law enforcement. And, and you don't think the, the federal government bears any responsibility in, in how that, that whole thing went down? Well, I, I'm not going to speculate as I'm sure the Bundys have their position. They vocalized it. What I'm going to say is the government's position is that a crime occurred when that happened. And, uh, and we, we had a trial, several trials on that. It, it, one of them was ultimately dismissed with prejudice. And we're trying to re get review of that decision. Let's talk about something that is a priority for you, Project Safe Neighborhood. Uh, you know, that, that's basically a, a federal effort to help local law enforcement keep the streets safe. Why is it the federal government's job to get involved with local law enforcement? Sure. I mean, this is an area that I'm so passionate about, and I could talk about it all day. I won't. But uh, basically, uh, Project Safe Neighborhood is like the best tool in the department's tool shed to fight crime uh, in violent, uh, violent neighborhoods. So the, the whole premise of it is getting the community leaders together as well as law enforcement, local, state, federal, to go after violent criminals in the most dangerous areas and uh, get them behind bars, off the streets. It's also a partnership on the other side in prevention and reentry programs, which is equally important. The reason the federal government uh, should be going after violent crime is because we have the, the effect, uh, we can have a, a big effect with the type of cases we be, bring, racketeering cases, wiretaps, drug trafficking. Those are the reasons that, uh, that violent crime is important. So you feel like you can reduce violent crime in, in Las Vegas? Well, it's working. In, in, in October 2017, Sessions put out a memo that said uh, we needed to reinvigorate uh, the Project Safe Neighborhood program, PSN 2.0, so to speak. And uh, since then, what we've seen is a marked decrease in violent crime uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the district. The sheriff, uh, uh, Sheriff Lombardo, has a lot of credit for that, as well as all of the police chiefs and local sheriffs throughout Nevada. But I believe that the department's justice, putting this at the top of its priority list, is, is also a, a contributing factor. You know, what, what looks different after this has been in effect or, or continues to be in effect in a year? You know, how does Las Vegas look different? Well, I think it's safer. I think that, that people... Uh, and what does that look like? Does it look like, you know, gang members going to jail? What are those specifics? Sure. So, I mean, I, I rely on my experience. Uh, I've charged cases and been involved in cases where we've taken down dozens and dozens of gang members, uh, and the murder rate in those areas of the city have fallen from above 30 a year to below 10 a year. So you can have a real impact when you eradicate an entire criminal enterprise in one prosecution.
you know, at the state level, there's efforts by lawmakers to limit the cooperation between state and local and federal uh, law enforcement agencies, especially when we're, with regards to immigration enforcement and ICE. Does that concern you? Does, does limiting that cooperation increase the potential for, for crime? Sure. The, uh, the Department of Justice's mm -hmm. position on this is clear, and I, and I believe in it, that law enforcement works best when law enforcement is working together. Uh, and the good news is, uh, for everyone that's viewing it is that uh, the sheriff and I in, in the north and in the south and all of uh, the elected sheriffs are working hand in hand together to make sure that the immigration cases our office brings have the biggest impact. And what I mean by that is uh, violent criminals, people that are drug traffickers, people that are repeat do domestic violence uh, offenders, repeat DUI offenders. These are the people that, uh, that we are uh, conferring about and we are using federal resources to go after. Yeah, so the, the scenario you always hear is, look, there's an illegal immigrant, great member of the community, he's got a headlight out, he gets deported. That, that's not happening? Well, what I can say is our office, and this is sort of a theme through this entire interview, we have limited resources. Our office brings about 100 immigration enforcement cases every single year. And when we bring those cases, we look hard at whether or not uh, the person is meritorious for federal prosecution. And what that means is every single, every single factor I just uh, talked about, violence, a history of domestic violence, a history of uh, gang violence, those are the factors that we look at when bringing those uh, cases. We're going to have to leave it there. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you, Victor. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Remember, if it involves Nevada politics, we're talking about it right here on Nevada Politics Today. I'll see you next week.